But Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11, we're going to be to in just a minute. But as we head there, I want to mention to you the fact that 4,100 years ago, which is a long time ago, which is a great deal of the history of the planet Earth as far as this book is concerned, okay? Um, God made a promise to a man. And God, who cannot lie, who does not change, promised that man that he was going to do something with his family and with his descendants of his family that was going to stretch from that moment clear through to heaven. And it would be an unbroken promise and a continuation of what began in Genesis 12, 13, 14, and 15. Now that has been greatly believed for centuries until modern times. And now that promise that God made to that man named Abraham has been relegated to almost with Adam and Eve and Jonah and the whale and all the other things that people are jettisoning these days. And no one believes anymore that God has made a promise to Israel that is his prophetic clock that if you watch, you can tell what time it is. You see, God promised a man that he would attach to him the very name and authority and credibility of the eternal God. And that man Abraham watched God make a covenant with himself in Genesis 15. Because God says, I can't promise by anybody else but by myself. So God promised by himself, by making that smoking lamp and that, that blazing furnace go through a pathway of blood of animals slain. God cut, as it were, a covenant. I'm going to share with you that covenant tonight, starting in Isaiah chapter 11. And, and you say, oh, it sounds kind of boring to me. Well, if you listen to the news at all, we have BNN News Service. You ever heard of CNN? We have BNN. That's uh, uh, my son, John, Barnett News Network. His cell phone gets the news on it. It's I don't know how it works. I don't know how, but I know it's free. And he's always reading to me the news uh, as we drive around. And he's telling me the latest, you know, tanks in Bethlehem, tanks in Bet Jala, tanks in whatever of Israel. And every time I see that, I'm reminded of the fact that the second largest press corps in the world is headquartered in Jerusalem. In, in the, one of the smallest countries of the world. And that there is an inordinate amount of media attention that is focused on that nation. And that should help us to realize that every time you read the paper, you should have a little jar inside of you to know that what you're reading in the news today is verifying the Word of God. Every time I hear about another 60 millimeter mortar, another grenade attack, another Sbarro Pizzeria bombing, another United Nations uh, racial conference condemning Zionists for their bigotry against the Arabs. That would be like accusing Hitler of running, you know, a, a benevolence home for children. You know, I mean, to think that there's bigotry by the Jews against the Arabs when, when they're surrounded by 800 million people that are hostile to them, and there are just barely over 4 million of them, is amazing. Let's listen to what God has to say, because modern Israel, which, by the way, is not at all like biblical Israel, but it is somewhat relative to it, occupies one-sixth of one percent of the land area which the Arabs own. Did you hear that? Israel constitutes one-sixth of one percent of the landmass of the Arab League. That means that they have 99.4 percent of the pie. Israel has 0.6 percent of the pie. And all of them want that peace. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that unbelievable? When there is no oil in Israel, there is no natural resource. I mean, everyone says, oh, the Dead Sea is why Russia's going to march in Israel. That Dead Sea, oh, there's nothing. The Dead Sea has potash. Who needs potash? You can get it out of Arizona. You can get it from Utah. I mean, they sell it out of Indonesia. What is it in the Dead Sea? That's not why Russia's going to march there. 
It's because of God. There are 788 million hostile Arab nations, or hostile Arabs living in nations around Israel that dwarf Israel's 4 million Israelis. The Arab nations have the oil, they have the wealth, they have the worldwide influence, they have inexhaustible resources at their command, and Israel is a postage stamp sized piece of land that you can't even see on most maps. In fact, if you're politically correct, it's not on them. Did you notice that? Israel is not on most UN maps. It's called disputed and occupied lands because it's the only spot on the planet God said, that's mine. And that's where my name will dwell forever. Over and over he says that. Well, in defiance of all reason, it is the focus, the land of Israel is the focus of the world's attention, and that is because that's what God prophesied. Did you know that? When God said, I'm going to make Israel to be the cup that causes the whole world to tremble, when those words were written by the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 12, verses 1 through 3, when he wrote that, Israel was nothing. It was less than it is now. That was 2,600 years ago. The prophet Zechariah sat in his little, whatever his house looked like in Jerusalem, looking out the window at the Mount of Olives. And as he looked out the window of the Mount, onto the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem, the Spirit of God came on him, and he saw Jesus Christ returning and his feet touching down on that mountain. And he wrote some of the most stirring words in the Bible about the second coming of Christ. And as he wrote that, the Spirit of God instructed him to write that Jerusalem would be a cup that would cause all, all. And remember, God doesn't exaggerate. We do. God doesn't. God says all the nations on the earth will tremble because of Israel. Really? As Zechariah wrote that, within a few years, the Babylonians came and wiped them out. And there was no Israel. He massacred them. He took off the royal family. He leveled the temple. He knocked down the walls. There was no Israel. It was just blackened rocks and a latrine for passing shepherds. But God says, I'm not through with them. And Jeremiah had written that there would be, after 70 years, a return, a first return. And Jeremiah said, after 70 years, God will draw back his people back to his land after the land had experienced the Sabbath rest. See, God really takes this rest thing seriously. They didn't rest, they worked on the Sabbath day. They wouldn't stop harvesting their crops, they wouldn't stop shearing their sheep, they wouldn't stop clipping their vines, they wouldn't stop harvesting their olives and crushing them. So God says, I'll take the time myself. You won't serve me on the Sabbath. I'll take the 70 years you missed of rest. And he did. And God made the land rest for 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, God stirred the heart of the greatest king of the day, whose name was Cyrus. And Cyrus, God named him 150 years before he was born. And God says, I'm going to cause Cyrus to be my anointed one who will send my people back to Israel. And the first return came. And you all know about the first return because that was Ezra and Nehemiah, that whole period of time. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Haggai was prophesying, Zechariah was prophesying, and Malachi was prophesying. And God was at work. And there was a return to Israel. And you all know the story. For 400 years, they lived in the land, and there were great saints. Some of them were named Joseph, Mary, Zechariah, Elizabeth, Simeon, Anna, John the Baptist. You all have heard those names. Those are those people, descendants that came back. And Israel came into what we call the New Testament time. And Jesus came down and Jesus ministered and gave them the gospel and made a lot of promises to them and talked to them. And then one day he stood on the side of the Mount of Olives and he looked over the city and he said, there's a day coming when an army is going to come and it's going to dig a trench all the way around the city and it's going to put up walls and barricades. And every one of you are going to be wishing, wishing that you were not in this city and he wept over the city. And exactly 40 years later, 40, a number of testing, the Roman legions encircled Jerusalem, just like God said. What's interesting is the New Testament Christians who knew their Bible left Jerusalem just like that. They remember what Jesus said. He says, don't stay in the city when it's surrounded. The Jews who didn't believe it stayed. And one million of them died. 
and the Romans absolutely leveled the place. In fact, you cannot find a single trace of Herod's temple, not a trace. You can find the underneath supporting foundation rocks. You can't find one single rock on top of each other on the Temple Mount. And the Jews were dispersed now not to, not to Egypt and Babylon and, and Assyria and all that area around. The Romans dispersed the Jews as far as Britain, as far as India, as far as Russia, and into Africa. Did you realize that? That's how far. They, they said, we will never let them be a nation. They were banned from returning to Jerusalem, and they were under the order of death, not allowed to come and circumcise their children and do all the other Jewish things in that land. And they went to the furthest ends of the earth. 